prayer and then dive into the material. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, with the news of Sue's passing, we ask you to be with us all as a church family. Uh, we know how active she has been throughout the years. We ask you to, uh, to be with us as we mourn, be with us as we take a lesson from the life that she lived of service. And as we get into this lesson today, and we talk about your servants in the book of 1 Samuel, we ask you to keep that in mind of how we're supposed to be living as servants for you. Be with us as we study. Help to guide our thoughts and our minds towards the lessons that you need us to take from this. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So, 1 Samuel, chapters 4 through 24. It's a big span, so we're going to be going quick. You can barely hear me? Oh, okay. Let me, uh, first of all, I hate these microphones. Let's just start with that. Is that better? I'll try to talk loudly. All right, let me see if I can get these off. That's one. That's two. All right. Now, in about five minutes, when it gets hot in here and they kick back on again. Um, so, anyways, First Samuel chapters four through twenty-four. So we pick up in 1 Samuel um, after Eli has called Samuel. And we're now talking this major chunk of the book from the beginning of Samuel's ministry to the people of Israel all the way through the beginning of King David. Now, as you also know, the readings this week also included a lot from the book of Psalms, kind of scattered Psalms. I think there was half a dozen or so. Um, we will not be talking about those in the middle of this class today, at least not from, the, from a presentation standpoint. Um, Reverend Ken is going to be speaking on Psalms starting next week. Yes, okay. Um, so I decided just to let him take care of all of Psalms. We'll just let him deal with that. Um, but anyways, so I want to try to give some a little bit more of a historical context of what's going on through the state of Israel um, as we're going through this. So when we talk about, if I can get this to work, there we go. I'm looking at, I, I wanted to break this down into five major sections within the book of 1 Samuel, at least this section of it. Samuel's leading of the people of Israel, Israel's call for a king. Saul's leading of the people of Israel. And then I think there's a whole section on the downfall of Saul and all the wonderful things he does wrong. And then the rise of David. And that's where we'll pick it up uh, today. So the first few chapters of this section, we're talking about Samuel in his role as the leader of Israel. Lots of conflicts going on. Main conflict, as we see throughout this entire section, is with the, the Philistines. Uh, lots of famous stories in that, and we'll get to those in a little bit. But we kick off this entire section, and Samuel kicks off his leadership of Israel with a battle with the Philistines and the ark being stolen. Not a good start. We're going to dive right in and lose the one thing that God said would lead his people through the, through the wilderness and into the promised land. We get the death of Eli. We get scenes of the ark with the Philistines and all the uh, accompanying horrors. We get a confrontation between God and Dagon and the statue of Dagon being knocked over repeatedly and eventually having its head removed. 
So as we get into this section, what type of leader was Samuel? Somebody tell me about the qualities that Samuel brought and, and how he displayed his leadership in these initial sections. Who we got? Mr. Weaver. Margaret? Margaret. <laughs> Don't okay. kill yourself, man. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Oh, uh, well... Um, Samuel's mother dedicated him to the Lord uh, when she prayed for him. She, she never had a child before. And then um, Samuel was raised by Eli, and, and um, he really did uh, love the Lord, and he obeyed God more than, Le more than Eli did. He was a he was faithful and... Um, when he led Israel, he, he, they realized he was a prophet and a judge. Okay. So, would you consider Eli, or excuse me, not Eli, uh, Samuel, um, to be a military leader? No. Not at all. Yes and no. Tell me why yes. Margaret, we're going to keep you busy over here. Oh. Anita. It's already on your good. I, I say yes and no because he showed qualities of both sides. Okay. But he always had the focus on God. So he always had the focus on God. But at the very beginning there, they lose the ark to the Philistines. First battle out of the gate they lose the thing that is supposed to be most precious to them. Because Eli is not focused on the worldly pieces. He's focused on God. He's focused on being a prophet and to being a spiritual leader as much as he is anything else. But in the midst of this, who is supposed to be or who is functioning as the real leader of Israel during this time? God is. This is the period of time where, yes, Samuel is the appointed leader. This is the one that God identified as to be the person who's supposed to be his representative. But God's supposed to be the one in charge. God is the one who's actually leading them. And yes, the ark was stolen. And yes, it went to the Philistines. And yes, the Philistines were punished. And their God was put down. And there were lessons learned. Showing again how God takes the tragedies, takes the negatives and uses him for his own purpose. Got another question, Dave? Hold on, hold on, wait for the mic. We're gonna keep Margaret busy. You got the good side, Chris, you just gotta sit there, you're good. I was gonna say they trusted in the Ark of the Covenant and they thought if they had that with them, they'd win all the battles. It was a symbol, um, icon, or whatever you wanna call it, almost an idol. And they, when they did capture, the, they kept it for 20 years. But Samuel led them, even though they had the, you know, the... Um, even though the ark it? was missing. Yeah. So again, it shows that God was really the leader. Go ahead, Ryan. No, no, no. Just, 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 you gotta just that. Do, do, no, no, bent my trouble book. Come, 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 come out of of this. Yeah, okay. I'm not catching it. Sorry. No, oh, you're bloodline. Okay. He's getting at the bloodline. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. No, 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 Just, just that. Do, do, do it. So, so book, book. Come, come, come. Ah. Uh. Of this, 
Yes. Okay. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know. Let me, let's come back. Let's come back. Okay, hold on. Hold that thought. Okay. Um, no, you're fine. So while, I, I think Dave, Dave brings up a great point, is that to some extent maybe the people of Israel had started to rely too much on the ark, and they thought it was some sort of a magic talisman that as long as we have the ark, it doesn't matter what's happening. And God said, no, I'm what's, what's important. The ark is for me, not for you. And so he proved that after the Philistines took it, and then finally they brought it back. But at the end of this, the people of Israel started to really complain. I'm sorry, we got another question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I did have a quick clarification real quick before Please. you move forward. Yeah. When we're talking about the Ark, are we talking about the Ark of the Covenant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's all I needed. No, you're good. I apologize. I should have specified. It's yeah, all talking, good. Yeah, you're good. We're talking the Ark of the Covenant here. And so as the Ark gets brought back and the Philistines pay their tributes back and they get the Ark back, around this time, and we get into chapters 8 through 10, Samuel's getting older again. The ark was gone for 20 years. Samuel starting to age. Who are the successors? Who are Samuel's successors? Come on, come on, come on. Somebody knows. Who are the successors directly? It was his sons. And were they, were they good judges? Yeah, they kind of stunk. So you go with Samuel, who was a, who was a good and godly leader but they lost some battles and needed God to come and rescue them. And then we get into Samuel's sons and they just do a terrible job. And so what's the response of the people? Give us a king. We want a king. We want to be like everybody else. We want a king. But who's supposed to be their king? God is. And so Samuel tries to convince them, no, 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 you don't want a king. God is your king. And finally, God even goes to Samuel and says, they're not rejecting you. They're not saying that you've done this. They're rejecting me. They want an earthly king. Pause there and take it forward, I don't know, a little bit of time. Why didn't the Israelites... Why didn't the Jewish leaders recognize Jesus? Because they were waiting for a king. They were waiting for a conquering king. Very similar to the way the people of Israel back then were looking for a king. They wanted something tangible. They wanted to be mighty on the battlefield. They wanted to be a mighty nation. Missing it the entire time that the kingdom that they're supposed to be serving isn't here. So we get into their clamor for a king. So God says, fine, I'll give you a king. And he gave him Saul. What kind of leader was Saul? Good at first won some battles, kind of did what they expected, but then what? So he started sinning. God would say, go in. I remember the, the one example that, that just continues to stick out of my mind. God says, go in and wipe out this entire people. Wipe out everything. Don't leave anything living. And Saul said, great. Yeah, except I'm going to keep the, the, the good cattle and the good sheep. And we're going to take those, but we're going to sacrifice those. So it's okay. Earthly kings do what? They serve who? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, earthly kings tend to try to preserve their own power. And, uh, and that's kind of where Saul went. He did indeed. 
Um, did they get what they, what they needed, the people of Israel, or did they get what they wanted? Much like children, they got what they wanted, not what they needed. They didn't get the king they needed. They had the king they needed. They didn't like it. Hold that thought. Give Mark a chance, a second here. I'm not so sure it wasn't that they, they didn't like him. They didn't like the people that were leading them. But why? The judges, because they were sinful okay. people. And so they said, we got to have something different from this. Okay. So. But they were still looking where? They were looking to the people instead of to God. And that's really the common thread that we, we get throughout this entire section is they consistently, they being the people of Israel, let me clarify, they consistently are looking to, to the people that are leading them. And what are these people doing for me? It's a good thing we don't do that here in the United States at all. I mean, it's not like we look at the people and say, oh, what are you doing for me? Oh, absolutely we do that in the church. What's in it for me? What's, what am I getting out of this? Chapter 15. What was the final straw that caused Saul's downfall? Pull up chapter 15. And why did God withdraw his support from Saul? Dave's going to teach the class. Got all the answers in this class. <laughs> oh, for one That's why thing. I always like to have a Dave here because Dave's just going to answer all my questions. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> Um, he, he consulted the witch of Endor to, to find out whether he ought to go to battle or not because God wouldn't answer him anymore. He got completely away from God and God wouldn't answer his prayers anymore. His downfall was that uh, he did his own thing. He thought that he, um, he went ahead and went in battle when he shouldn't have. And, you, you know, God... God told him that him and his sons would all, day, would all die if he went into battle, but he didn't listen to them. He did his own thing. That, so if you follow anything into the classes that I teach long enough, I have a theory. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It was, it was for dramatic effect. We appreciate that. Punctuate that. Um, <laughs> Clean up at aisle two. <laughs> now we talk about this in our connection group, and Laura knows this. Laura Dysha knows this. I have a theory that all sin stems from one sin. And what is it? Pride. pride. Did Saul display pride? The sin of pride? Of course he did. He started listening to himself. Well, I know God said to do this, but this is what he really meant. I, I know this is what he really meant. So I'm going to go do this. Yeah, we don't do that at all. But again, I, that's why I still have the opinion. And again, I'd love to debate this with anybody who wants to. I'm of the opinion that every single sin that we commit comes back to pride. Because we're trusting ourselves rather than trusting God. So then we get into... Chapters 16 through 24. So if you go back and you look at when Saul was introduced, look at the description that we got for Saul. Can somebody read 1 Samuel 9, verse 2? Somebody on this side of the room, because Chris needs exercise. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Oh, great. I say Chris needs exercise, he gives it to his wife. <laughs> yes, here you go. Chapter 9, verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man, 
There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So what's the description we get? Tall, handsome. You get this, you get this rugged, manly man. That's the picture that we get. Okay, somebody read for me 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. All right, we got one right here in the middle. All right, 1 Samuel 16, 12. My version here says, And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Very good. So, slight this difference in the description. Yes, they're both handsome. What's the one key phrase that he uses to describe David that he does not use to describe Saul? He had beautiful eyes. So what? Does anybody know what that means? Hold on, hold on, Pat. <laughs> Your eyes uh, are the reflection of your soul. You know, when you look in someone's eyes and, and God was looking at the inside of David and not the outside. Perfect. In Hebrew, the word for eyes is the same word that really describes your essence. It's who you are. In fact, in the benediction, when we talk about God, when we, we talk about may God turn his face towards you or may God lift up his countenance on you, the phrase that's behind that is that he looks at you with his eyes. That it's God's essence is upon you. So when we talk about the difference between Saul and David, Saul was, yes, he was this physically opposing or imposing man, handsome and tall and strong and whatever you want to use. David, of course, was, again, not very tall. He was a little guy. But his eyes. He had beautiful eyes. He had a beautiful essence. So God was finally looking inside. If you look at the advice in Samuel 16, 7. For Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And the phrase that we hear for, uh, about David throughout the rest of Scripture is he was a man after God's own heart. So when we're talking about David, where does he first come in? We get the story, I mean, we get the story of, of Samuel going to see Jesse, and Jesse's sons are paraded through. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. He's in the sheep pen. They even had to call him in, because they were like, no, there's no way this is a guy. So they brought him in. We get this picture of David, and God says, yep, that's him. But when does Saul first see David? So there's a discussion here in uh, 1 Samuel 16, 14 and 15. Somebody want to read that for me? Give me a volunteer. Go ahead, Frank. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Continue. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre, and when the harmful spirit from God is upon him, he will play it, and you will be well. Thank you. So who do they bring in? David. So 
So Saul's first interaction with David is this young man playing a liar, soothing this harmful spirit. Now there's a whole discussion, and I want, this is part of what I want you guys to talk about at your table. What's the nature of that spirit? It bothers a lot of people that verse 14 says, a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So talk about that when we get in a second here. So anyway, so they bring David in. David's the one to soothe Saul. The one with beautiful eyes, the one with this beautiful essence is able to keep Saul calm. And what's the description we get of Saul's reaction to David? Love these things. Saul loved him. He looked on him and he loved him. He really appreciated David's ability to help him. And as we move on, Saul has a very generally positive appear, or, uh, opinion of David up until Goliath. So we all know the story. I'm not going to go into the story of David and Goliath. We all know the story. David took the, left the five smooth stones. He slew the Philistine and cut off his head. But from that moment forward, pay attention to Saul's reaction to David. All of a sudden, he's threatened. David was fine so long as he was this, this young kid who was just kind of making me feel good. But all of a sudden now he's this magnanimous personality who just went and stood up for the people of Israel. From that point forward, things go downhill in their relationship. Say again? Because of his pride. Look at that. It comes back. So how does the progression of Samuel to Saul to David fit in the meta narrative? And again, as we're talking about within the Bible recap, there's the same narrative that exists throughout Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, it's the same story. It's one story. It just continues in little minute parts. So these are questions we're not going to answer right now, but I want you to take these to your table. We've got these questions and then two, and a couple more here on the next slide. Talk about the progression of Samuel to Saul to David into the meta narrative. Go ahead, Steve. Hey, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, but you've got to think about Saul. His own son was rejecting him as a king. That, I mean, that's pretty significant. I mean, if that oh, yeah. doesn't kind of just unfloat your boat. No, it does. I mean, in addition to the fact that, I mean, we talk about Jonathan loving David and how close they were. In truth, everybody loved David. I mean, he was just one of those people. But I think he was one of those people because he had such a heart for God. So remember, talk about, in your groups, where do we see Jesus throughout this section? Where do we see the reflection of the Messiah throughout this section? What's the foreshadowing of the Messiah? We talked a little bit about it already. But let's talk some more. And where is the story of salvation shown? Get to that in a minute. So it's 10 o'clock. I think they told me they wanted to end early for pictures and stuff. So uh, take 15 minutes, break into your groups, talk about those questions. I'll leave them up on the board. Talk about that progression, talk about the meta narrative, and where do we see. The foreshadowing and the reflection of the Messiah. 15 minutes. So let's start off. Let's start off with the meta narrative. Where do we think, where do we think we see the meta narrative in this? Era? What is that? How does this progression from Samuel to Saul to David? How does that fit in with the overall narrative of the Bible? Somebody's got it. All right. 
so the discussion, uh, you don't have to go very far, I'm, this is short. Um, no, the, the discussion we had was, you know, Samuel's very godly, right? Okay. Saul is very earthly and very about himself uh, and, 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 you know, power and all that other good stuff and, you know, doesn't adhere to God. But then David comes along and, you know, as, as we were talking, you know, along comes Goliath and all this other stuff. And David kind of resembles or um, represents deliverance, right? And so if you think about it in the kind of the, the arc of, of the Bible, and we just do it at wave tops, you start off Garden of Eden stuff. You know, you're very godly, close to God and everything like Samuel was. Yep. We screw up. Golden calves are had by all and everything else. And then all of a sudden we need a redeemer and a savior, you know, which leads us to Christ yep. at some point or the other. And so it kind of, you know, again, represent, it's very representative of that, that kind of um, that character arc, if you will, yep. or that cycle, yeah. Good. No, I like that. What's interesting is, uh, and I remember years ago, um, I was asked to teach a, a class for um, high school students, and we got into that. We were in the middle of, of the Old Testament, and we were in all the, and talking through all the judges. And what's interesting is there's that similar cycle with all the judges. It's a, that the people are with God, so God brings them a judge to lead them, and the people start to fall away from God, and then they get something bad happens. Either they get conquered or they get disease or pestilence. Or, I mean, it, there's all kinds of negatives that happen. And then that brings them back to God. And so there's that constant cycle of, I'm okay, I'm with you. Nope, I'm falling away. Nope, I need to be brought back to you. Again, that's the same narrative that we see throughout scripture, both on a macro and a micro level. Others? Sorry, I just moved that. Others? Any other thoughts about the overall meta narrative? Going once, going twice. Okay. So where do we see Christ? Where do we see Jesus? Where do we see both a representation and a foreshadowing of the Messiah? We got a little bit of what we just talked about with David coming in as the, the Redeemer on a micro level. What else? Oh, I got it. Thank you. David was a man after God's heart, and Jesus was a man after God's heart. Yeah. David was concerned with God. Jesus was concerned with God. And David was the lineage of Jesus. So we start to see that progression through the, the Davidic line consistently represented. Others? Anybody else? Nope. Thought I saw a hand. Okay. So let's get back to the big question. The aside question. Did God send a harmful spirit? Did God send a spirit to torment Saul? Anybody think yes? Anybody think God's in the business of tormenting people? Okay, so one of the things that I found was interesting because that I, I, I saw that note and, and as I was reading through kind of some of the other summaries that people had done of this, this section, a lot of questions come. A lot of people have their faith tested by reading that and saying, why is God in the business of doing harm? Why is God trying to do this? And what's interesting is in, in Hebrew, the word that we translate is sent, which for us in English is a very active verb, that God actively did something. That my understanding of the reading, and those of you who've studied it more, I don't know, keep me honest, get Reverend Ken, that sent is not nearly as cut and dried as, as an active verb. It it's, can be a more passive, allowed, permitted, uh, it's a little more nebulous. And one of, the, one of the commentaries talked about, when you've, especially when you've got someone who's supposed to be of the leader of God's chosen people, there's an expectation of the adversary wanting to attack them. I mean, obviously, Satan wants to attack all of God's people. And what we see in this verse as 
God sending a harmful spirit could simply be God withdrawing his protection and allowing that to happen for purposes of correction, for purposes of, of um, showing his displeasure. Reverend King, please, tell me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. I'm <laughs> agreeing with you. But in my Bible, the notes indicate that this shows what God did with the evil spirit and Saul is that God, in the end, is in control. Agreed. So, yes, there are evil spirits in this world, and sometimes God will withdraw his protection, etc. But as Christians, we can always look to God and know that he's in charge, he's in control, and he will make sure that, well, no, he won't give us more than we can stand by trusting in him. So, in the I'm end, God... Glad you added that last part. ...is in control. I'm glad you added that last part, because that's, <laughs> that's also the other thing that, I, that, I, that came to mind was there's the phrase that, that unfortunately many Christian churches put out there, God will never give you more than you can handle. And they leave it there. And I'm personally of the opinion, no, God will give you a lot more than you can handle so that you rely on him. And I think that's part of what we're seeing here with Saul is, all right, Saul, you think you're, you're all that? You think you're in charge? Here you go. And one, interestingly enough, in that scenario, what calmed his spirit? What helped? We talked about that a minute ago. David did. Why? Because David was a man after God's own heart. That the introduction of that godly character back into the mix is what diffused the situation. All right. Just about at 25 after. Any last questions before we break? I'm going to have a closing prayer here in a second, and then we'll let you go. I think they're still doing pictures, maybe. I don't know what's, what all's going on. Okay, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, as I said, next week, we're digging into the Psalms. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for all of the conversation here today. Thank you for all of the wisdom. And thank you for, more than anything, showing us this continued story of salvation and redemption through your son. Be with us as we go into to service or as we go into the world. Help us to keep you in mind. Help us to be people after your own heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.